So I'm going to be talking briefly about the extra element theorem, uh, what it is, how to use it, and why you might want to. So the extra element theorem, sometimes called EET in various papers, uh, was invented by this guy R.D. Middlebrook. Caltech uh, in the 60s, I want to say. Um, so essentially what it says is you, if you have a two-port network where you've got a, some input voltage and current, some output voltage and current, and a transfer function, say H of S, uh, then if you choose to add an additional element in parallel to the existing network, then you can calculate your new transfer function from your old one. So h new, it's a function of s, is just your old transfer function, h of s, times 1 plus zn over zd divided by 1 plus zd over z. Sorry, this top... Uh, this top Z should just be a just be a Z. So and this is Z is referring to the extra the impedance of the extra element. So essentially it takes a problem that might be otherwise difficult, so you have to redo no, redo nodal analysis for an entire network and allows you to find just two new parameters, Z N and Z D, uh, which we will discuss shortly. So just the names of Zn and Zd, the subscript just means literally Z numerator and Z denominator, um, just makes it easy to remember. The Zd is um, at first the easier of the two to figure out. It's just the input impedance or the impedance seen by the extra element. when the input is sh nulled, so Vn equals zero. It's the Thevenin equivalent impedance. Seen by our extra element Z. So that's that's fairly straightforward, and we'll we'll calculate it in an example in a minute. Um, Zn is a little trickier at first. It's got a rather long name. It's called the double null, or sorry, null double injection impedance. And it's the same exact thing as above, essentially. It's the impedance seen by your extra element, but it's when the output is zero, and not when the output is shorted. So that's a distinction that will, uh, will become more obvious and more important as we, as we do an example. So if we want to do just a non something non-pathological, uh, say we are interested in calculating the output voltage of a uh, resistive ladder, just something, something simple. Um, we can interpret one of these resistors, this is our extra element. And uh, I've chosen this as the extra element because if we get rid of it, it makes the analysis a lot easier because to calculate the transfer function, let's just assume these all have the same value r, um, we can see that V out is just a voltage divider between this resistor and these two resistors, which is just 2r, which is if we cancel everything, just one-third. 
So v out over vn, that's our transfer function. And you see it's not a function of s. It, in general, it will be, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be if your network is just resistive. So now, if we want the transfer function with the extra element, then we need to calculate two driving point impedances. That's what they're referred to by, by Middlebrook and the literature in general. So the first one is uh, relatively straightforward. So we are going to ground the input and then calculate the equivalent impedance seen by our element Z. And we're saying that Z is just, it's just R, has a value R. So the equivalent impedance can be calculated by realizing that, well, this resistor and this resistor are in series, and collectively, these guys are in parallel with this resistor. So it's 2R in parallel with R, which is just R times 2R over R plus 2R, which is just 2 thirds R. Okay, cool. So that's uh, that was our first driving point impedance, uh, ZD. And remember, ZD is just the impedance seen by our extra element when Vn equals zero. So ZD is two-thirds R. Okay. So the next one is a little trickier, but it's actually much easier to calculate than, than it initially seems. So if we've got the same circuit as before, and we've got our extra element here, what we do is we set V out to zero. So we're not grounding V out, and I cannot make that clear enough. Essentially, we are saying that, okay, well, V in is going to have some value that causes V out to be zero if our extra element is taken into account. Um, so if we were to do this formally, we would replace our, and actually, let's just do that. So if we want to calculate input impedance, we replace our element by a test voltage, Vx, and then we calculate Ix coming out of it, and then we say that Z, Zn in this case, is just Vx over Ix. That's just how you calculate uh, input impedance. So if we say that this node here is zero, um, at first, it might seem a little odd, uh, because that means that, well, this voltage here is zero, and this voltage here is zero, so there can't be any current flowing the through the resistor. So, and there's no other path for the current to go, so this current also has to be zero. And since that current is zero, there's no voltage drop across this resistor here. And we know that this node here is zero, so this node must also be zero. And that was sort of a, a couple logical steps, but we didn't actually have to do any circuit analysis. And we can just directly write, um, we, we know Vx now because Vx has to be zero. Zero divided by Ix. And Ix in general is some non zero value because it's just equal to V in over R, which doesn't have to be zero. V in can take whatever value it pleases, but we know that Vx must be zero. So the driving point impedance or the double null injection impedance, uh, it's a little, little long for my taste, is just zero. If you want to be really specific, zero ohms. So our overall transfer function h new was h old, in general it's a function of s, uh, times 1 plus zn over z divided by 1 plus zd over z. Now, we just calculated zn, it's 0, right? So we're just left with this 1 and this zd term on the top. So we calculated zd previously, it's just 2 thirds r, 
So, and what was our h old value? So our h old was uh, well, it, did, it looks like oh yeah, we calculated it was one one third yeah one third. So it's just one third times one over one plus two thirds r over r because z remember is our extra element that we're adding. So these r's cancel and we get one third times one over five thirds. The threes cancel and we're just left with one fifth. And so that's our new transfer function. Now you might say, well, I could have just done that immediately from using nodal analysis, and you'd be right. Uh, this is an example where it is actually simpler to use um, probably simpler to use nodal analysis than to use the extra element theorem. But the benefit of the extra element theorem really starts to become apparent when you have really large, really complicated circuits uh, where you just need to add one more element. For example, you have a transistor model and you want to add a capacitance to make it a little more accurate. This way you don't have to redo all of your circuit analysis. And it's more general and more more powerful, and there's all sorts of applications for it. But... Uh, but this is kind of the first one. Uh, I think I'll make a, another video with a more complicated example that will kind of justify using the extra element theorem. But this is the general process for uh, how, how you use it. I'll also put a link in the description to the original paper from Middlebrook on how exactly the extra element theorem is formulated. I have, on, in this video, only gone over the parallel uh, form of the extra element theorem. There's also a series form, so if you want to, rather than inserting an extra element in parallel with some part of your network, if you want to squeeze it in between previous elements, uh, there's a form, a slightly different form for that, that version. So, thank you.